He spoke to over a hundred million people, sharing the love of Jesus Christ. He had more newspaper coverage than any other man of his time, including two presidents of the United States. He loved Jesus Christ, and he loved America. Welcome back to the Church History Podcast. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. Today, we're telling the story of a man who shaped not only the American church, but also the culture of America. It's an inspiring story, although it is filled with a little controversy. If you're new to this podcast, I tell the church's story in chronological order, and I started all the way back with the life of Jesus Christ in episode one. And after four years, we are reaching the end of the 1800s. And our story today is of Billy Sunday, and it starts in 1860. America was the land of opportunities in the 1860s. While there was a lot of opportunity, there was also great challenges. And during this time, a lot of immigrants came from Germany to America. Germany was facing extreme poverty because of crop failures. There was also a failed revolution in the late 1840s. And in the 1860s, there was still a lot of political unrest in Germany. Germany was mostly a Protestant country, and Catholics and Jewish people faced a lot of persecution, so a lot of them came to America for freedom. Of course, Germany would later, in the 1900s, become known for its horrific treatment of Jewish people. When the German families arrived in America, they faced extreme difficulties trying to assimilate into the American culture. Of course, language was a huge hurdle, but there was a lot of other hurdles to overcome. Many of the German immigrants found German communities. Cities like New York, Chicago, Milwaukee, all had German communities that they could find acceptance in. I personally am of German descent, so I humbly say there's many aspects of the German culture, the heritage, the traditions, the food, the craftsmanship that have become both part of American and, where I live, Canadian society. One of the families that came to America was the Sontag family. And one of the things the Sontag family faced was people were not pronouncing or spelling their name correctly. So the family adopted an English name, Sunday, and they became the Sunday family. William Sunday was a bricklayer. He was one of the sons of the Sontag family who changed his name to Sunday. William Sunday moved to Iowa, where he met a beautiful young woman. She was the daughter of Martin Corey, who was the town squire, a farmer, a miller, a town blacksmith, and the town wheelwright. His daughter was Mary Jane Corey, and William fell madly in love. He convinced her father to let the couple marry, and they started the Sunday family of Iowa. This was the family that Billy Sunday was born into. Billy was born during the Civil War in the year 1862. His father, William Sunday, was enlisted in the 23rd Voluntary Infantry. After only four months of fighting, William caught pneumonia and died in the army camp in Missouri. He died just five weeks after his youngest son, William Ashley Sunday, known as Billy Sunday, was born. Mary Jane was left alone with her children. She took her children and moved in with her family, and Billy's grandfather became the father figure in his life. After a few years, Mary Jane remarried, and little Billy Sunday found himself with a stepfather. However, his stepfather was not a good man. He didn't treat the family well, and after a few years, he left them, abandoning Mary Jane and her children. Billy Sunday was 10 years old. Mary Jane could not provide for her family. Her choice was either let her family starve to death or give away some of her children. So Billy and his older brother were sent to live at the Soldier's Orphan Home in Gledwood, Iowa. At the age of 10, Billy had lost his father, moved out of his grandfather's home, who was the father figure of his life, 
then abandoned by his stepfather, and then given away and sent to an orphanage. At the orphanage, Billy did receive an education. He was also taught good habits and structure, and most of all, he was given the opportunity to develop athletic skills. After four years at the orphanage, Billy was allowed to move to a farm to work as a stable hand for Colonel John Scott. Now this was an important part in his life. Colonel John Scott was a former lieutenant governor, and he extended a helping hand to this young Billy Sunday. He gave him employment, but also a sense of belonging. Billy Sunday worked on the farm, he cared for Shetland ponies, and he performed a whole bunch of different farm tasks. But he was never treated as a hired farmhand. The Scott family treated Billy, who they took in at the age of 14, as if he was their own child. Billy found a good home in the Scott home, and the Scott family made him attend Nevada High School, where he was able to get a high school education. Although he never received a formal high school diploma, by 1880, Billy had more education than a lot of his peers, and it turned out he was very smart. Billy got a job working for the local fire brigade. Today, he would be a firefighter. While on this job, he joined the local fire brigade baseball team. And this is when people saw just how talented Billy was. Three years after moving into the Scott family, his life changed again. There was a man named Cap Anson. He was a famous baseball player. He was talking to his aunt and his aunt would not stop talking about this young man who lived in her town who played on the local baseball team. Cap Anson, who was a baseball player, agreed to let Billy come for a tryout for his team just to please his aunt. But Billy would have to travel to Chicago for the tryout. When Billy traveled to Chicago, he used all the money he had to buy his ticket. When he arrived in Chicago, he had only one dollar left to his name. When he showed up to meet the team, Camp Anson saw this little country boy who was wearing a $9 suit and wondered why did he agree to do this favor for his aunt. He had heard that this kid could run fast, so he said, Billy, are you willing to race the fastest man on our team? Fred was the fastest on their team, and Billy agreed to race him. The team gathered around to have a good laugh expecting to see Fred destroy this little country boy. Fred put on some running shoes and looked over at Billy and asked, where are your running shoes? I ain't got shoes like that. I ain't never even seen a pair of shoes like that. Billy took his shoes off. I run barefoot. The team was all laughing at this point. Fred and Billy went to the starting line. Fred got down on his toes and fingers in the starting position, ready to run. Billy stood there looking at Fred, wondering, what was this guy doing? He asked, you saying a prayer before the run start? Cap Anson ordered the race to start, and they took off running. Billy beat Fred, easily, the fastest man in the National League of Baseball. And Billy Sunday, running barefoot on the track, beat him. Billy Sunday was signed to play professional baseball for the Chicago White Stockings that day. Today, the team is known as the Chicago Cubs. Billy was a young man, abandoned by his family, raised in an orphanage, working as a hired hand on a farm when he entered the professional baseball world. And it didn't start well. In his first game, he struck out four times. In fact, he struck out his first 13 times at bat. However, the coaches saw that while Billy, not a great hitter, he was exceptionally fast, and he became famous for his base running and his outfield action. The crowds loved to see Billy stealing bases. He stole 96 bases in just one season. Billy became the first person to circle all the bases in 14 seconds, from a standing start. Fans loved Billy, and his teammates loved him too. He became known as being trustworthy, and he became the team's business manager. He ran ticket sales, budgeted travel expenses, and did other administrative tasks. 
In the late 1880s, Billy's Sunday's life took a big turn. Billy and his teammates were in Chicago on a night off from playing baseball. The New York Giants were in town, and players from both teams were spending the time together in the south end of the business district of Chicago. As they walked along, they heard something. The sound of hymns being sung. And the hymn they were singing was the hymn Billy's mother had sung to him as a child. The sound of the hymn drew Billy. They found a group that had set up an outdoor service in an empty parking lot. The Pacific Garden Mission was holding an outdoor evangelical meeting. The baseball player sat on the curb and watched the group. Billy found his mind, taking him back to the log cabin he had lived in with his mother. He could see, smell, and hear her as the group sang his mother's hymns. A young man, Harry Monroe, came over to talk to Billy. He told the group, we have a building just two blocks away, and he invited them to the service. Billy decided to attend. The meetings were different from those of other churches. Multiple people stood on the stages, all sharing how they had become Christians, and there was singing in between each of the testimonies. Then a man stood and invited people to come to Christ. Billy watched as people came forward, turning to Jesus. Billy returned to the meeting house night after night. Billy was struggling with the idea of Christianity. He wanted to come to Christ, but there was something holding him back. That is when he met Mrs. Clark. She was the wife of the group's founder, and her sweet, motherly love made him stop and listen. She was so wise. And at that moment, Billy knew he needed a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That day, Billy prayed to God, repenting his sin and turning to Jesus as his way to God. This personal moment in his life suddenly became national news when a journalist who was attending the meeting saw what happened and wrote about it. Baseball players were often criticized for their lack of good character. They were not known for piety or moral living. And the idea that a baseball player would attend church and give his life to God seemed a little unreal. Billy knew the other team members and the players they played against would see these national headlines. There was going to be mocking and people would be watching him. It was a hard start for a new Christian with much pressure. The next day, Billy walked into the room where the men were preparing for practice. He knew they had all seen the headline in the newspaper, but he didn't know what was going to happen. Mike Kelly one of the players, known for having a hard and very impure lifestyle, walked up to him. He put his arm out and shook his hand. Then, Mike drew him in for a hug, patting him on the back. God bless you, Billy. If that is how you want to go, I will make sure no one puts a stone in your way. One by one, the players came and shook his hand, saying congratulations. The next day, the team played the Detroit team. Both teams were close to making the championship game. It was down to the wire, and Billy began to pray, Oh God, I'm in an awful hole, and you just got to help me catch that ball, and you don't have much time to decide about this either. He saw the ball in the air. He rushed towards it, but the crowd had already started to overflow into the field in anticipation, and the ball was going above the crowd. As he ran, he was shouting, get out of the way, get out of the way. The crowd moved and he ran through the crowd. He turned, looked over his shoulder, put his hand up in the air and caught the ball. And the game was won. Billy began to visit the Jefferson Park Presbyterian Church. It was within walking distance of both his home and the ballpark. He was living his life differently than his baseball friends. They loved to drink, but Billy would only order a lemonade when they would go out. In 1886, Billy was introduced to a young woman named Helen. For Billy, it was love at first sight. But for Helen's family, it was a very different thing. 
Billy was not the kind of man they had imagined their daughter falling in love with. He didn't have a father to show him how to be a good father or husband. He hadn't grown up in the faith, and his job was playing a sport. Helen's father believed that professional athletes did not have real jobs. They were unstable, and there was no job opportunities after they were too old to play sports. Helen's father was a well-known businessman in the area. Helen, who went by the name Nell, had grown up in a privileged home with all the opportunities and education. Nell and Will's childhood could not have been more different. However, even though Nell's family did not like Billy, he did not give up pursuing her. And over time, they saw that Billy really was a man of integrity who loved their daughter. It was Nell's mother who first saw that Billy was a man of integrity, and she knew he was a good match for her daughter. With her encouragement and with Billy's good actions, Nell's father eventually embraced Billy and allowed them to marry. Billy Sunday and Nell Thompson became the Sunday family when they married on September 5, 1888. Their honeymoon was traveling with the baseball team. Just three years into their marriage, in the spring of 1891, Billy made another choice that changed his life forever. Billy was offered a new baseball contract to play for his Cincinnati team. He would get $3,500 a year. That was a significant payment for his time. When I ran this through a converter for inflation, it showed that today he'd be making just under $100,000. And it was a good contract. But Billy felt God was telling him to leave baseball and not wait until he was retirement age. At the same time, he was offered a different job. Billy had been speaking at YMCA's for a while, sharing his testimony, and he had participated in the Bible study for his local YMCA. Now, I have discussed the YMCA and its impact on the gospel spreading during this time period. In the show notes, I'll include links to some of those episodes. Billy was offered a job as an assistant secretary with the Chicago YMCA. This would pay him $83 a month. If you ran that through a converter for inflation, it would show up today as being about $24,000 a year. So he had two offers. Today, those offers would look like $100,000 a year or $24,000 a year. One path had money and fame. The other, the money would barely make ends meet and he'd be an assistant secretary of a Bible sports club. The world was shocked when Billy turned down the baseball contract and walked away from a sport that had made him a household name to take the job of an assistant secretary. Once he started working for the YMCA, his job was far beyond secretarial work. He met with people to help with their spiritual needs. He visited sick people. He talked with people in despair. Then he started visiting saloons to talk to people who were drinking and invite them to evangelical meetings in the area. His payment was not only low, but often late, and once he went six months without a payment. Then, two years later, Billy started working with a famous preacher named J. Wilbur Chapman. Mr. Chapman was a very shy man who would stand in the pulpit and through the power of the Holy Spirit, preach messages that shook to the very core of the audience. Mr. Chapman became Billy's mentor and taught him how to preach. He showed him how to prepare a sermon, read and interpret scripture, and construct a sermon. During this time, Billy Sunday studied the Bible, and this is when he gained a lot of biblical literacy. Remember, he didn't grow up in church, and so he had so much to learn. Billy began to preach some of the sermons in Mr. Chapman's meetings. At first, Billy tried to copy the preaching style of his mentor, Mr. Chapman, He stood and talked like him, but it didn't feel natural or right. Eventually, Billy Sunday realized he had to be the person God created him to be. He started running across the stage to make a point. He would do his famous slide into home plate slide during one of his points. He was animated and full of energy, and people loved it. When Chapman returned to pastoring a local church and was no longer running evangelical meetings, Billy began to pray about taking his place. He was offered the opportunity to return to the game of baseball. Billy and Nell prayed about it, and Billy decided to not return to baseball, but to instead take the place of Chapman and continue the meetings as the preacher. 
but no one had heard of him as a preacher, so who would ask him to come? Then he was invited to a meeting in Iowa. In 1896, Billy Sunday held his first independent evangelical campaign in Iowa. Mr. Chapman had left him seven sermons, so he preached one each night. But so many people came that he was asked to stay another week. The thing is, he only had seven sermons, so he preached the same sermons again. This was the first meeting that started that would lead to millions of people hearing the gospel. Billy held services in Chicago and Pittsburgh, and the media covered the large crowds that came. Billy Sunday became a household name, not for his baseball, but for his love of Jesus Christ. Of course, he had to have more than seven sermons, but when he prayed and asked God to give him sermons to preach, God did just that. Life was changing fast. The 1800s were left behind, and the 1900s came into play. The machine age had started, the automobile was created, and life in America was moving from rural life to city life, as people embraced the Industrial Revolution. As the rural life was leaving, so were the old ways of seeing life. The women's right movement started, the famous March on Washington occurred in 1913, but as the 1900s began, the movement was on the rise. The crowds at baseball games were full of people who had once met in churches. Entertainment took the place of the Puritan principles that had founded the country. This was the country Billy Sunday was preaching in. His theology was conservative. However, his preaching style was radical, and he drew in crowds who were, quite frankly, looking for entertainment. But what they found was the hope of Jesus Christ. A lot of people who were already inside the church didn't like Billy's style. But the church had lost its influence on society. Some churches had lost their influence by completely ignoring the world and refusing to see that the world was changing. But other churches had lost their influence because they had absorbed the world, and they didn't offer any hope beyond the life people were living. Billy was able to take complicated theological concepts and teach them in a way that was so simple any person in the audience could understand what he was saying. Billy would say he would rather speak only five words that people understood than 10,000 words nobody understood. He said, I want people to know what I mean. I speak to where they are. He was famous for a couple of sayings. Here's one of them. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. He also said, if you're a stranger to prayer, you're a stranger to the greatest source of power known to human beings. But he also said, and if you don't do your part, don't blame God. Every time he spoke, the next day in the newspaper, there would be cartoon drawings and quotes from his meetings. The ultra-conservative preachers did not like this. They said he was vulgar and that his language and movements on the stage were completely disrespectful to the pulpit. They said he should stand still behind the pulpit and preach using dignified words. Billy answered, If the English language gets in my way, I just trample all over it. Purity is no more a sign of religion than a toupee a sign of hair. Both cover a bald spot. Some preachers would condemn his services, saying that a revival in the city was temporary and not something to be happy about. Billy would say, you say a revival is temporary, so is a bath, but it does a person good. He faced the harshest criticisms for his prayers. Billy prayed and met God where he was, a poor, uneducated man from a small rural town who had grown up in poverty and in an orphanage and then spent his formative adult years in the locker room of an athletic man. He didn't come to God with the pomp and grandeur of the Harvard-educated pastors who were criticizing him. But the people who were closest to Billy knew that prayer was paramount to him. He prayed about everything, and he prayed all the time. In fact, one man named Homer Roadhaver, who worked with him, said he would even hear him talking to God when he was in the bathroom. He talked to him all the time. He was always talking to God. 
He became known as the baseball evangelist. In fact, one newspaper called him the P.T. Barnum of Revivals. P.T. Barnum was known for his great traveling circus at the time. In 1903, Sunday began working with the Presbyterian evangelist that I mentioned earlier, Homer Roadhaver, who accompanied him with music during his campaigns. He played his trombone and wove it in the air when he wasn't playing it. He would march around the stage playing the songs while people sang songs that were made popular during the Billy Sunday meetings. Imagine it's 1908. You're in Charlotte, North Carolina. There is a revival service, and you've been invited to attend. As you get near, the crowd is growing. You've never seen so many people gathered to hear anything, let alone hear a preacher. You're squished into a seat, and then you hear the preacher. Civilization and society rests on morals. Morals rest on religion. Religion rests on the Bible and faith in God and in Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't condemn any man because of his wealth. The Bible says the man that don't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. According to our standard of gold and silver, Abraham was worth a billion and a half of dollars. David was worth three billion. Solomon was worth five billion. Solomon could have hired Andrew Carnegie for a butler, J. Pierpont Morgan to cut his lawn, and Andrew Mellon for a chauffeur, and John D. to black his boots. America needs a tidal wave of the old-time religion. America needs to be taken down to God's bathhouse and the hose turned on her. And the time isn't far distant when the wheels of God's judgment are going to go sweeping through this old God-hating world. And I want to take a pledge in this audience to join me in a pledge that you will never rest until this old God-hating, Christ-hating, whiskey-soaked, Sabbath-breaking, blaspheming, infidel, bootlegging old world is bound to the cross of Jesus Christ by the golden chains of love. You realize something as you listen to the sermon and look around at the audience. Your town will never be the same. Over 40,000 people attended that meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina. The city faced a revival that changed and shaped it for decades. And everywhere Billy went, he would set up a tent and preach. Then, one day, during a meeting in Chicago, an early winter storm hit and destroyed the large tent he was using for his meeting. So, from that moment on, Billy would have a tabernacle built in any town he was coming to. The buildings would seat anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 people, depending on the city he was visiting. The buildings were built with doors to the outside at the end of every single row of seats, so if there was any emergencies, people could get out quickly. The floor was made of sawdust, and this is where the term hitting the sawdust trail started. When the city asked him to preach, He would only come if every single church agreed to have him, and if all of the churches closed on Sunday and everyone came to the tabernacle. That, of course, he would have built. He would not come if even one church disagreed. He wanted unity in the city and hearts to be prepared for a revival. Billy would preach two things, the evil of sin and the power of God to save you from sin through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He preached with no hold on the consequences of sin, the consequences of sin in your life, in your family, in your business, in your city, and even your country. Sin would be the downfall of America if America did not turn back to God. After he would leave a town, the effects of the revival would be felt in every single part of the city. Newspapers would cover stories from store owners who said old bills had all been paid up. Factory owners said that their workers were all showing up on time. People reported that drunkenness that caused people to miss work was cut at least in half. And many men stopped drinking completely and would become fit and ready for work, becoming good husbands and fathers. In one town, 
200 saloons completely went out of business in one year after Billy came to preach. That was in a town where more than 25% of the town had come to the altar to give their life to Christ. Now, after hearing all of this, I have to say, if you were to meet Billy, you would be surprised by what you would find. He was actually quiet and shy and would rather spend time with his wife and children than with anyone else. He would be nervous if he knew he had a meeting with one or two people. He was never sure what he should say. If he was to meet 10 or 20 people, that would scare him. He never told a joke or a story in a small group meeting. At a party, he was the quiet man standing in the background. But once he stepped behind the pulpit, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit would wash over him and his fear would disappear He would speak to tens of thousands of people with not even a hint of fear. He would tell stories that captivated the crowd, and everyone was drawn to him, hanging off every word he had to say. With no microphone, he would speak 300 to 400 words a minute to crowds in the tens of thousands, all in the power of Jesus Christ. In 1917, New York City hosted Billy Sunday. The tabernacle seated 16,000 people, and it was packed every service, and Billy had two services a day. The governor of New York, Governor Whitman, dedicated the building, and John D. Rockefeller Jr., who was living in New York at the time, was part of the committee that prepared the city for Billy to come and preach. While that service was going on, America went to war. As World War I swept over America, people sought spiritual leadership. Billy Sunday spoke to soldiers and held patriotic rallies to boost the morale during the war, while preaching that the only way to find true peace is through Jesus Christ. Billy's father, who had died in the Civil War, was the son of a German immigrant to America, who was now preaching to American soldiers heading to Germany to fight in a war. Billy loved America and had a great patriotic love for his country. He raised money for the Red Cross and the Army and Navy branches of the YMCA. He helped to raise awareness for Liberty Bonds, and he did all he could do to aid the country he loved in this war. When the New York meetings ended, there was a final offering, and this offering was supposed to pay for him to come and preach. Billy told the crowd that the entire offering would be donated to the war effort. It was $113,000 that came in. If we adjusted the value to today's inflation, it would be $2,398,612. In his New York meetings, 2 million people came to hear him preach, and this was literally while America was entering the war. Just under 100,000 people had walked down the sawdust trail of the altar to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And Billy Sunday shook hands with every single one who came to the altar for salvation. One man who came to Christ was someone named Jack Cardiff. He was a boxer who retired and became Billy's trainer. He would ensure that Billy was prepared for the hard work of preaching, especially since Billy was so active during his sermons. He would help him relax his muscles afterwards to keep himself healthy and prepared for the next day of preaching. Billy's meetings continued throughout the war, and many times his meetings would take the top billing in the newspaper, leaving information about the war below the fold or even on page two. One headline read, 20,000 children make tabernacle tremble with shouts for Sunday. Another headline read, women gasp as Sunday speaks plainly to them. Bars the tabernacle to men. This was for women-only meetings. As the war ended and the raging 20s started, Billy preached hard about what he saw as moral decay, the family breakdown, and the negative societal changes. He spoke harshly about the use of alcohol, and he began to run campaigns to stop the alcohol industry. He became the voice of the temperance movement. If I were to talk about the temperance movement right now, it would take a long time. So we're going to do an entire episode on the temperance movement in our next episode. However, it's important to know that Billy Sunday's preaching changed society and even enacted laws. 
Through it all, it was Nell, who everyone has started calling Ma, who was the backbone of Billy's ministry. She was his encourager, his protector, his administrator, and the mother of their four children. They had one daughter named Helen and three sons, George, Bill, and Paul. Billy strongly believed that the church should be involved in social issues and that it should be the leader in these cases. Some people were angry because of the sides of the debate he would take. Here are some of the issues he spoke about. He believed in the women's right to vote. He also believed that there was a need for sexual hygiene to be taught in schools. Billy said, Love is the purest gift of God. Infidelity is harmful to a person, and you should never marry an infidel. He spoke about divorce, saying that divorce laws would damn America. He spoke for the rights of the laborer and the need for laws to keep the laborer from being exploited. Billy was asked to open the Congress session with prayer. At this time, it was the only time that Congress had applauded during a prayer, and this is actually in the congressional record. The word applause is in the record three times during his prayer. On November 7th, 1935, the New York Times had this headline, Billy Sunday Dies, Evangelist, Was 71, Former Ball Player, Induced Thousands to Hit Sawdust Trail to Conversion. Wife tells of his death and came quickly as he had prayed it would. Gave the last sermon October 27th. Billy had a mild heart attack and his doctor told him he needed to take time away from the pulpit to recover. But Billy was in the pulpit that Sunday preaching and died just one week after his last sermon from complications from his heart attack. His sermon was entitled, What Must I Do to Be Saved? His funeral was held at the Great Moody Church in Chicago. The church could see over 4,000 people and was completely packed for his funeral. But on the day before the funeral, even though it was raining, throughout the entire day, there was a steady line of people who came to say the final farewell to their beloved preacher. Over one million people walked the sawdust trail, shook his hand, and gave their life to Christ. Each one of them was given a paper explaining what it meant to be a Christian and how to live a successful Christian life. One of those men who walked the sawdust trail was named Lucius A. Eddy. He was the president of the People Bank. He was 75 years old when he gave his life to Jesus Christ. He started a group called the Sunday Businessmen. He took business people in the town and he would go out and share their testimony of salvation. Eddie came to Christ at the age of 75. By the time he died at age 92, he had led over 4,000 men to Christ. Billy and Nell Sunday had personal contact information and stayed in contact with over 1,000 pastors and missionaries who had come to Christ during Billy Sunday's preaching. Next week, we're going to discuss Billy Sunday's biggest influence on society, his push to get alcohol out of America. But what was the lasting legacy of Billy Sunday? It was the men and women who came to Christ and then went on to preach and lead others to Christ, who then went on to lead others to Christ. We're going to close with this testimony of one of those men. I was brought to Christ through the preaching of the evangelist Billy Sunday in the city of Boston. I was 24 years of age at the time and utterly indifferent to the things of God and agnostic, I think, <laughs> At least I was read in the literature of agnosticism and felt that I could answer most of the propositions that preachers put before me concerning my responsibility to God. The church didn't have much for me, it seemed. Always I felt the preacher was saying, be good, be good, and there were two things wrong with that. One was that I knew I couldn't be good if I wanted to, and the other was I didn't want to be good in the first place. But this man told me something else. Billy Sunday said I was a sinner and that I needed Christ. I found something so earnest about the man that I couldn't help but listen intently to what he had to say. As I recall, I didn't believe a word he was saying, but was impressed with the fact that he believed everything that he said. Of course, he had many illustrations and told many stories, and I knew that I ought at that time to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and profess him as my personal savior. So I made my way 
to a doorway and bucked the crowd that was coming out of the tabernacle during the invitation, finally got down the old sawdust aisle and got close to Billy while he was shaking hands with people that came forward, gripped his hand so hard that he said, young man, don't grab it. And uh, I let go, of course, and sat down. I accepted Christ as my savior. And shortly after that, I felt the call to the Christian ministry and have preached the gospel for many years now, have seen thousands of people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in one of my churches, I know that more than 200 young people decided for Christian service and today are scattered all over the world. Now I feel that what happened to them happened to them because of what happened to me through Billy Sunday who preached the gospel to me and inspired me and I was privileged to preach the gospel to them and they were inspired to Christian service. <laughs>